My name is Tim, I'm an alcoholic. Very glad to be here. Thank you to everyone for being here. Um, I don't speak on behalf of, of AA. Uh, this isn't an official AA meeting. I'm also an Al-Anon member, uh, but I don't speak on behalf of Al-Anon. Um, if anything I say is useful, wonderful. If it's not useful, don't worry about it. You don't need to tell me. Uh, now, the topic, topic tonight is about how to rely on God. Uh, funnily enough, there's going to be surprisingly little talk about God because most of the job of relying on God has got to do with uh, uh, what I do in the material world. There's nothing fancy, nothing esoteric. But before we get to that, before we get to that, uh, we've got the question of why we're even talking about God in the first place. Uh, there are going to be lots of big book quotations. So uh, fasten your seatbelts for those I'll be calling page numbers. <laughs> be a bit like bingo. Uh, but no one shout house all the way through. Um, we don't need that. So page 24. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. So this key feature of my alcoholism is that I started having horrible, horrible consequences from, from the late, uh, late 80s, and it got very bad in 1989 when I was living in Germany. Um, I mentioned that because I, was, I, I would have been underage in the UK, uh, but I was of age when it came to alcohol in Germany. Uh, I started having bad consequences, but uh, most of the time it didn't occur to me to not drink. When it did occur to me to not drink, I couldn't. Uh, all that occurred to me was this beautiful warm glow around the notion of having a drink. So th this is the key idea about alcoholism. Uh, there's nothing we can do about the physical craving that kicks in after the first drink. Our real problem as it says, bottom of 23, top of 24, is the fact that, well, certainly if, if you're like me and you're not like an alcoholic in the big book, uh, the fiscal craving doesn't get triggered unless I have the first drink. Who takes the first drink? I do. I am the problem. It's not the alcohol. I am the problem, specifically my inability to uh, retain a sufficient and balanced view of alcohol to stay away from it. I'm not stupid in other areas, so it's not stupidity. I'm not mad universally, so it's not madness. It's something else. What is it? Alcoholism. There we go. So if you want a definition of alcoholism, it's got nothing to do with images you're familiar with on the television or stars in court cases, nothing to do with that. It's got to do with the simple fact of being unable to stay away from the first drink despite the experience of consequences. Page 11, his human will had failed. I summoned an immense will to stop drinking forever. It, ooh, in just after New Year, 1993, I'd had uh, uh, something of an episode in the National Gallery in London, which is not somewhere you want to have an episode, and in the middle of the Munch exhibition, which was on at the time, if you please. But in any case, I had this episode. I said, I'm right. I don't like the fact I'm going to have to give up drinking forever, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm absolutely going to do it. I managed for about two weeks, then I was off again. My human will had failed. Page 37, our sound reasoning failed to hold us in check. Uh, I remember in about March, April, 1993, I was now living in Russia, don't ask. And I traveled, I was in AA at this point, and I traveled all the way from St. Petersburg to Moscow, um, which is a, a long journey. Uh, to stay with some friends in Moscow in order to, uh, to go to an AA meeting. There were some AA meetings in St. Petersburg. They were all in Russian. I spoke Russian, that's fine, but they were terrible. By any measure, they were terrible. So I thought, 
If there's an English speaking meeting in Moscow, maybe I'll try that. So I get to Moscow, I turn up at this address and uh, I go to go into the meeting, but there's no one there. There's an old woman, old babushka sweeping. And I, I said, yeah, I asked her in Russian, you know, where, where are they? Are, have you seen any Americans meeting here once a week? She said, last saw them three months ago, they would not been back. And that was the end of that. No meeting, disappeared. No, before the internet, no way of tracing where they were. I thought, well, I've done so well to even get this far. I think I deserve a drink. I'm going to have a little drinky. And the little drinky turned into being in blackout on the circle line of the Moscow uh, subway uh, and forgetting where I was staying. And miraculously, I found my way back in, in blackout. I don't know how. My sound reasoning failed to hold me in check, page 37. It's almost looking as though I'm identifying with what it says in the book. Um, page 45, our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. August 1993, I'm, ooh, three weeks sober. No higher power to speak of, rather dismissive and contemptuous of the notion of God. I was treating uh, AA canteen style, take what you want and leave the rest. Trouble is, I was doing the picking. <laughs> I was the one that couldn't remember not to drink. And then I was doing the picking about what I was going to take and what I was going to leave. Bad move. My human, so human resources, the human resources of me and the human beings around me. I was going to a billion meetings a day. I was making a billion phone calls. I was constantly talking to other members of AA, witter, 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 witter chit, chitter, chatter, chitter, chatter, chit, the whole time. And I got to 11 o'clock, 10, 10 to 11, 10 to 11 one night. And um, I was at home. I'd spent the whole day trying to do, I'd been at work, but I'd spent the rest of the time doing AA things. I was apparently doing everything right. But I thought, I feel like I'm going to have a drink. I feel like there's nothing I can do to stop it. There was no one else to call. The last few phone calls, I knew exactly what they were going to say before they said it. The magic had worn off. So there was no point in calling anyone else. What are they going to do? They can't do anything. They can't stop my head. I know I'm going to drink. Uh, now, I didn't drink, but we'll come to why in a little bit. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. So the, hot, the, the, the massed forces of AA with me, but with me without a higher power, without a personal relationship with a higher power, I was on the verge of drinking for the umpteenth time. Going to meetings and being surrounded by nice people who say, the right things does not stop me from drinking, might stop you, doesn't stop me. If that's enough for you, my hat is off to you. <laughs> go, go and do that. <laughs> if you stay on the call, maybe you're like me. Um, page 26, Roland Hazard, who was, as it were, Bill W's grand sponsor. He, Roland, had consulted the best known American psychiatrists. Then he had gone to Europe, we call this taking a step up. Then he had gone to Europe, placing himself in the care of a celebrated physician, the psychiatrist, Dr. Jung. Not Adler, not Freud, but Jung, who prescribed for him. Though experience had made him skeptical, he finished his treatment with unusual confidence. His physical and mental condition were unusually good. Above all, he believed he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and its hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. Nevertheless, he was drunk in a short time. This is why I don't hold much, set much store in terms of sobriety with any, all the medical stuff, all the psychiatric stuff. Maybe that's necessary on the journey, who knows, I don't care. Point is, it doesn't solve the fundamental problem. Because the fundamental problem is that part of my mind will always want to drink. And if I do what I want to do, I am going to drink. 
And no amount of self-knowledge is going to sort that out. Fascinating character. His mental life is fine. His physical life is fine. And yet he drinks. Uh, Fred, pages 39 to 43. Splendid personality, perfectly successful. He's got his external life sorted out. Roland Hazen's internal life was fine. Uh, Fred's external life was fine. They got drunk. The answer is not understanding my childhood. That is not what this is about. If you want to go and do that, you know, be my guest, but it's got nothing to do with the solution here. It doesn't work against alcoholism. It might work against other things, but it doesn't work against alcoholism of my type. Page 27, by, by the time we get to page 27, Jung has said, oh, by the way, there are some exceptions in history. There are these people that have vital spiritual experiences and they have these massive internal rearrangements, the psychic change that gets talked about in the doctor's opinion. And Roland is cheered by this. But then the doctor carries on, page 27. This hope however, was destroyed by the doctors telling him that while his religious convictions were very good, in his case, they did not spell the necessary vital spiritual experience. So uh, getting my mind sorted out will not help. Getting my body sorted out will not help. Getting my life, my circumstances sorted out will not help. Getting my shit together won't help getting my, they say in AA, yeah, get your marbles back. That won't help either. <laughs> because there's a, one of the marbles is problematical, <laughs> but you don't know which one. <laughs> so let's not put the marbles in charge. The marbles are your problem. Um, the last thing you want is your marbles back when it comes to um, alcohol. T have someone take your marbles away from you, namely the higher power. Uh, religion won't help. You see, this is the funny thing. This is going to be about how to rely on God. And I'm going to say religion doesn't help. So it's something to do with God, but not religion. Now, none of those other things are bad things. You know, getting your mind sorted out, getting your body sorted out, getting your circumstances sorted out, joining a religion, practicing a religion, becoming the archbishop of wherever, the bishop of Bath and Wells. These are not bad things, but they're not the solution to alcoholism. There are treatment centers for priests. There are psychiatrists in AA. <laughs> there are psychoanalysts in AA. Boy, are there psychotherapists in AA and Al-Anon. You go to an Al-Anon meeting, you say psychotherapist, everyone's hands go up. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank God we let everyone in. Uh, so what is the solution then? Um, Dr. Bob had a spiritual life before he got to AA. Isn't that funny? He had a spiritual life, but it didn't solve his alcoholism. So a spiritual life in the ordinary sense of, you know, having a lovely, cozy relationship with God. Ooh, that's not, that's not, that's not it. Because Bob had that but he kept relapsing. Let's see what made the difference. Page 155. This is about Bob. Some time later, and just as he thought he was getting control of his liquor situation, he <laughs> talk about downplaying and not alcoholism, his liquor He went on a roaring bender. For him, this was the spree that ended all sprees. He saw that he would have to face his problems squarely, that God might give him mastery. One morning, he took the bull by the horns and set out to tell those he feared what his trouble had been. He's going to make amends. He makes amends. He found himself surprisingly well received and learned that many knew of his drinking. Well, I bet that was a surprise. <laughs> um, it's not, I mean, he was a proctologist whose hand shook. People knew about his drinking. Um, stepping into his car, he made the rounds of people he had hurt. He trembled as he went about, for this might mean ruin, particularly to a person in his line of business. 
At midnight, he came home exhausted, but very happy. He has not had a drink since. This was written in 1939. He never did drink again. If you want a, if you want a relationship with God, make amends to everyone. There you go. See, that's not so nice. This is not as nice a little prayer bowl, little cushion, all the candles, all the tarot cards, trip to Nepal twice a year, your know, special spiritual retreat in Bali or Thailand. People would never go to Bogna Regis for their spiritual retreats. It's always something pretty, isn't it? Make your amends. <laughs> That'll do it. And there are some other things too. Uh, and very interesting as well. Uh, yeah, prayer and medit prayer. Page 157. Um, we're on to Alcoholic Anonymous number three. He interrupted. I used to be strong for the church, but that won't fix it. I've prayed to God on hangover mornings and sworn that I'd never touch another drop. But by nine o'clock, I'd be boiled as an owl. Apparently, that means like big, wide open, starey, glassy eyes with, with uh, you know, pupils different sizes, that kind of thing. So, so he was, a, again, a strong religious man who prayed. He had a relationship with God, but it was the foxhole prayer. And we're going to be looking at something more than that and different than that. Now, there is a little block, page 47. Besides a seeming inability to accept much on faith, we often found ourselves handicapped by obstinacy, sensitiveness, and unreasoning prejudice. Many of us have been so touchy that even casual reference to spiritual things had made us bristle with antagonism. So, I, don't, I mean, I was like this. I was such a crashing bore when it, someone mentioned God, I'd start squawking about this and squawking about that. Um, and I'm sure maybe you've been that, maybe you sponsored that situation. It's tiresome. Uh, this sort of thinking had to be abandoned. Well, that's a bit rough. <laughs> you mean I have to stop doing that? Okay. Though some of us resisted, we found no great difficulty in casting aside such feelings. Well, that's funny, because I was very attached to being a, a rather sort of militant atheist. Um, though some of us resisted, we found no great difficulty in casting aside such feelings. Faced with alcoholic destruction, we soon became as open-minded on spiritual matters as we had tried to be on other questions. In this respect, alcohol was a great persuader. It finally beat us into a state of reasonableness. Sometimes this was a tedious process. We hope no one else will be as tedious for everyone. Uh, we hope no one else will be prejudiced for as long as some of us were. So the point is, I mean, I have very well rehearsed. I, you know, I'd read my Bertrand Russell. I wasn't entirely ignorant, but I'd only read one side of the argument. I'd read all of the arguments for why religion was a load of bollocks, but I hadn't, um, I, I had no religious background or training. No, I didn't know anything. Hadn't read anything. Hadn't talked to anyone. Just sort of sat in my room, angry constructing sort of gossamer thin arguments out, out of Camus and, and Bertrand Russell, uh, thinking I was very sophisticated because I was referring to a Frenchman. That doesn't make you sophisticated, by the way. <laughs> Just because you can quote a French author in French doesn't mean your argument is sophisticated. You might be sophisticated, but it doesn't mean your argument is sophisticated. So I was almost entirely ignorant. I was entirely ignorant of the many smart people over history who are smart and effective, who did have a higher power of some description in all different cultures. I'd only listen to one side of the argument with smart and effective people who don't believe in God. My other half doesn't believe in God and is contemptuous of the whole, of the whole thing. We don't have a bone of contention between us. But the point is, with all of my objections and my, um, I, I just dismissed, I didn't even engage with the God thing. I just dismissed it thinking, well, that's for the silly little people with no brains. That's what, that's, 
who that's for. But back to 10 to 11, when I'd exhausted all human options, I was desperate, absolutely desperate. So I thought, I'm going to drink. And if I drink, I don't know if I'm ever going to stop. The last time I drank, I got run over, I got arrested. I could die if I drank and I knew I was going to drink. Something in me cried out. And I was staying with, staying with my old sister. She died now, poor old thing. But I was staying with her. She's, she was religious. Uh, and I, something inside me cried out and I saw a Bible in the room. And I can't remember the last time I'd opened a Bible. Um, I opened it and I thought, right, let's see what this has got to offer. So I wasn't even approaching it with a, it was, oh, let me turn to the Lord on high. No, I was like, let's see what this has to offer. So I wasn't even approaching it with a, with a decent frame of mind. And my mind had been chattering all day about whether am I going to drink? Am I not going to drink? Am I going to drink? Am I not going to drink? You know the deal, just dull. Round and round and round and round and round. And I opened it. And the first line I read, I kid you not, was be still and know that I am God. And my head stopped. And I thought, I better go to sleep now before it starts again. And I went to sleep and I got up the next morning and I had two thoughts, just two, two thoughts the next morning. Thought the first, uh, I'm really glad I didn't drink last night. Thought the second, damn, I need never drink again. Because all I need to do is contact that which contacted me. And all my excuse, I was out of excuses. Once it's worked once, you're sunk, absolutely sunk. And I had proof now that there was a power beyond my own reason plus marshaled willpower, wit and wherewithal. There was something in the universe. Number one, there was something in the universe beyond my wit and wherewithal beyond and higher than, that could pull rank on my wit and wherewithal. Secondly, I could have a relationship with it. It wasn't distant. It was proximate. Uh, as I say, I was, I was sunk at this, but I've remained sunk. I can't contend. And I've had this experience with so many problems in my life. I can't contend there is no power greater than myself. Uh, now, I can tell you, if you've got a problem with the notion of God or whatever, uh, you, can, you can set it aside very easily because the God that you have a problem with is almost certainly the God that someone else has described. Whatever anyone else has described you disagree with, just disagree with it. You disagree with enough things already. Disagree with that. You don't sort of hold it to your chest and clutch it to yourself and run around with it and say, well, this is the I, this is the God I don't believe. If you don't believe in it, fine. But if you disbelieve and disprove a hundred conceptions of God, that does not prove that God doesn't exist. It just proves those conceptions are inadequate. And it is impossible to exhaustively disprove all conceptions of God because they are frankly infinite. For as many people as there are, there's going to be conceptions of God out there. So trying to, you know, work out what God is by, you know, one by one eliminating all of the conceptions of God that God isn't, you're on a hiding to nothing because you've got to, you, you're going to have to talk to thousands of people to do that. They just, just don't worry about that. Um, and religion, you don't need to worry about, and, and so on. Um, and here's something very simple, a very simple way of looking at things. Uh, I had a problem I couldn't solve, alcoholism. I also had other problems. Let's say fear, depression. Did knowledge and willpower fix those? No. Good. We've now agreed we have a problem that we can't fix. 
then I start to ask questions like this. Is there information in the universe that I don't have? Yes, there's lots of information in the universe I don't have. Good. So we've established that. There is information. I don't have all the information in the universe. Good. Have you ever been encouraged by someone? Have you ever been in a situation where you couldn't do something, someone encourages you, and then you can do it? Everyone has had that experience a gazillion times, where power flows from outside of you to inside of you, enabling you to do stuff you couldn't do. The two commodities that come down from the higher power are information and power, direction and power, knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out, step 12. The only way to contend that that's not available is to say there is no force in the universe that has ever and can ever help me. There is no information outside of my own brain. You can't really contend those. It's very, very easy to see how, for instance, simply going to a meeting and finding yourself able to stay sober another day when you were convinced you could not stay sober another day, trying to get your own head out of your own behind all day by thinking about it and even taking the right actions. And you call someone, you call Sally, you call Bobby, you go to a terrible meeting where people talk rubbish, and then you suddenly feel better. That the evidence that there are channels for power to flow from the outside to the inside, you've got to be pretty, pretty bloody minded to deny both of those. So we know that a power greater than us exists and that from that power flows information and actual power that you can use. One needn't know what the power is or anything about it. One simply needs to be able to activate the mechanism. Uh, and there's daily activation of the mechanism, but there's preparing ourselves for that mechanism to be activated. That's the main thing. It's like physics and boiling a kettle. You don't need to understand, you don't need to know anything about the power station. You don't need to know anything about physics or power engineering or uranium depletion or any of those things to boil a kettle. All you need to do, all you need to know is where the switch is. And there's a bunch of switches that are in the big book. That's where they hit them. How to establish that relationship with God. Now, I did this little foxhole prayer in August 1993. I had to follow that, that up with a whole load of action. There are seven areas of the book where it says, if you do this, you're going to drink again. If you don't do this, you're going to drink again. So there are seven conditions to be met to establish a relationship with God. First one, resentment, page 67. But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal. For when harboring such feeling, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns and we drink again. The insanity precedes the drinking. And with us to drink is to die because we don't know if we're ever going to come back. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. Uh, the grouch and the brainstorm are not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal people, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. So if I want a relationship with God, I've got to forgive everyone for everything, not run around meetings brandishing my resentments like scouts badges. Oh, I got a resentment today. No, no, you want to get rid of it. It's going to kill you. It's not, it's not something to be proud of. It's not, it's not a hobby. <laughs> Sometimes it's treated like, oh, I, you know, I've got seven resentments today. Ha, 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 ha. It, this is grave. This is potentially fatal. Yet what spiritual Paul used to say, we used to call him a spiritual Paul because it was spiritual. Um, these AA nicknames can be very, very st straightforward sometimes. He said, you want to drop it like it's hot. You want to drop it like it's hot because it's going to kill you. Harmful conduct, number two, page 70. If we are sorry for what we have done and have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we'll, we will be forgiven and will have learned our lesson. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. So any behavior which is harming others 
is going to block me from the higher power. So first block comes from resentment. Second block to the higher power comes from harmful conduct. What we're going to see with these seven blocks is I don't need to look for God. I don't need to find God. I need to remove the blocks and poof, God shows up. So I don't need to read books about God. I need to stop. I need to pay, pay my taxes. How about that? I need to stop fiddling my taxes with complex legal mechanisms so that the next chap plays, pay, pays a little bit more in their taxes so I can pay a little bit less. These thousand little ways in which I diddle the universe thinking I'm one up and the whole time I'm separating myself from the higher power. Secrets, page 71, this is the third death threat. Uh, this is for doing step five, the best reason first, 71. If we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. Time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. Trying to avoid this humbling experience, they have turned to easier methods. Almost invariably, they got drunk. Having persevered with the rest of the program, they wondered why they fell. We think the reason is that they never completed their house cleaning. They took inventory all, all right, but hung on to some of the worst items in stock. So this is not about complex self-analysis. It's about telling the truth to another human being and looking them in the eye and say, this is what I did. How about that? <laughs> and most of the, most of them are not even listening. It's oh, okay, well, I did that too. You did what? You know what I mean? It, it's whatever you've done, someone else has done it. I mean, there's some you know scary stuff that you hear, but there is always someone who's done it. Fourth one, unmade amends, page 77. We will ne never get over drinking until we've done our utmost to straighten out the past. Utmost. The, the, the most underrated word in the steps is, is uh, well, it's, it's in eight and nine uh, by implication. Uh, all people we had harmed, all people we had harmed. So including the exes, including the people that have harmed us. So if I've harmed Bobby and Bobby's harmed me, that does not let me off the hook. What if Bobby started it? That does not let me off the hook. What if Bobby harmed me eight times more than I harmed him? Doesn't let me off the hook. What if they're in another country? What if it was 30 years ago? Um, none of these things matter. Have I done my utmost? Uh, and not just a cursory, you know, big ticket numbers, everything, every little theft, every little ruptured relationship needs to be looked at. Not everything can be fixed, but things can be resolved in peace. The difference between having one unfinished amend and no unfinished amends is not to be underestimated. If you've got a balloon which is attached to the ground with a thousand pieces of string and you cut 999, you still have one piece of string, the balloon is still attached to the ground. Whilst there is anyone I have not done my utmost to make amends to, the ego has grounds for saying, I know what you really are and is gonna keep me from God because my ego is scared I'm gonna go back to God because if I go back to God, I don't need the ego to protect me anymore. I don't need the ego to give me an identity and a purpose and a value in the world. So it, the last thing it wants me to do is to go back to God. What is the best way to keep me from going back to God, to keep me frightened of God, to keep me frightened of punishment for what I have done or what I think I've done? That's why I have to make every single last amend. So there is, when, when the ego comes to me saying, you don't want to go back to God, God's going to get you. I can say, no, he isn't because to get. Whilst there is one outstanding amend, that line won't work. Because it knows, your ego knows what you're holding behind your back. Unfaced creditors, we must lose our fear of creditors no matter how far we have to go if we are liable to drink if we're afraid to face them. I had an employer where uh, they screwed me for X pounds. I screwed them back for a fraction of the X pounds. I did not stop being frightened of a certain part of London until I paid back the amount I owed them. 
even though to my mind they owed me 10 times more on a different matter, unrelated matters. I had to face them. When I faced them, my whole feeling about the city I live in changed. Everything is connected. Complacency, page 85. It is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We're headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We're not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Uh, every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. So the maintenance of a spiritual condition, when you, when you see them in the book talking about what getting spiritual means... Well, I'm going to say it, you're going to see it in the next two quotations, but on the subject of complacency, I don't graduate from AA. I don't do any less now in AA than I ever have. In fact, I probably do more. Why? Because when I say to God, what do you want me to do today? God keeps saying, apparently, well, go to this meeting, go to that meeting. When this person asks you to sponsor them, if the conditions are met, you say yes. Then you end up spending hours a day sponsoring people, going to a shed load of meetings. I'm, I'm not choosing any of this. Because I've taken step three. I chose to take step three. And step three means you have no choice anymore. You, you listen to, you, know, if you call the boss and you, you wait for instructions. Uh, complacency is really saying, well, I'm not going to bother with that. I'm going to plow my own furrow. I'm, I'll only do as much AA as I think I need to do to get by. To be complacent is to be back in the steering wheel, to, is, 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 to, is to kick God. Actually, the steering wheel is a bad analogy. Is to turn off the satellite navigation system and to drive wherever the hell I want. That's what complacency looks like. And working with others. Now, people who know the book very well will know what is coming. Uh, people that know me will know what is coming. Page 14, for if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual through, you'd think enlarging his spiritual life would be prayer, meditation, contemplation, talking to the nuns of Haggerston, talking to, you know, something, something fancy, something with italic handwriting, something fluffy, something pink and purple. And it's not. Uh, where is it? Enlarge, perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others. Damn, I thought it was going to be cozy. It's not. It's hard work. That's how you have a relationship with God. You put yourself to work for God rather than putting yourself to work for self. Um, for he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again. And if he drank, he would surely die. So again, this is, this is because I want to stay sober. I want to have a life. How? I've got to work for God. Um, page 156. Same, in case you thought that quotation on page 14 was some anomaly that slipped through the editing process. <laughs> yeah, it can happen. There are a couple of dud lines in the book. There's a dud line in the doctor's opinion. We'll talk about that another day, perhaps. But there's a dud line in that. Uh, but page 156. Life was not easy for the two friends. It reads like a children's book. It's wonderful. But life was not easy for the two friends. Plenty of difficulties presented themselves. Both saw that they must keep spiritually active. What is going to happen next? Prayer circle? Reading the Bible? No. One day they called up the head nurse of a local hospital. They explained their need and inquired if she had a first class alcoholic prospect. No prayer wheel here. Now, of course, they were praying. This is powered by step 11, but step 11 is not the end. It is the means by which we prepare ourselves for the business, which is helping others. So it's those seven areas which establish the relationship with God, clearing resentment through the activity of forgiveness. This is not something which comes to me in God's time. I always love the in God's time thing. Oh, I'm going to make that amend in God's time. Um, I'll tell you a story about, uh, I love a story. You can tell you a story about uh, in God's time. Um, Rabbi takes a coat to be mended to a tailor. And 
Uh, he says to the tailor, when will the coat be ready? And the tailor says, God willing, it will be ready tomorrow. He turns up tomorrow, coat still not ready. Rabbi says to him, um, when will the coat be read, ready? The tailor says, God willing, uh, the coat will be ready tomorrow. Of course, he doesn't do it. Next day, rabbi shows up for a third time, says, when is the coat going to be ready? Tailor says, God willing, uh, it will be ready tomorrow. And the rabbi says, and if we leave God out of it, when will it be ready then? Um, bloke walking past a monastery garden wants to ingratiate himself with the monk who's tending this garden. Um, he says to the monk, isn't this, isn't this a wonderful testament to the gl glory of God's creativity? And the monk says, yes, that's certainly the case but you should have seen it when he had it to himself. Um, the responsibility is with me. God will do for me what I can't do for myself. God won't do for me what I can do for myself. It's my job to get rid of my resentment. Doesn't mean I stop being human. It, stop, it means I stop with the attack thoughts up there. The, the attack thoughts as a hobby, which proceeds in real time in my brain. Attack thoughts against me or attack thoughts against you or the system. I love it, we have a resentment against the system, the government. <laughs> there, are all, there are lots of groupies, very vague groupings people get. Whatever the attack thought is, doesn't matter. Whether it's vague, whether it's real, whether it's fancied, whether it's something you read about, where you, you watched on YouTube, whether it's something that actually happened to you, doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what the focus is. I've got to take responsibility for getting rid of resentment, stopping harmful conduct, telling all the secrets, making the amends, facing the creditors, being strict with myself, re-complacency, and then working with others. Uh, the actual relationship itself, um, Bill's story is particularly good for this, but there are a couple of other points in the book which I, I like very much as well. Page 13, there I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood him to do with me as he would. I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing, that without him I was lost. If you like an image, a really helpful image I think for this is a light bulb in a string of fairy lights. If the light bulb is sitting on the sideboard, it won't do anything. It has to be screwed into the string of fairy lights to light up. Trying to achieve happiness in the world by any means other than complete surrender to and connection with God in order to do God's will, not my own, is like being a light bulb trying to light itself up by sheer force of the will without being plugged into anything. I'm not meant to operate on my own. I'm not meant to be a separate being. It's an optical illusion created by the physical body. It's never going to, it cannot work. The design, is, it, by design, it cannot work. Page 13, I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. You don't need to join a monastery. I remember in, I see a couple of people from Bristol. I don't know if you know Phoebe. Phoebe was 22 years sober, drank again, and then she was sober for another few decades. One that I, she, I don't know if she's still alive. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. She said when she first encountered step three, she heard the gates of the nunnery clanking shut behind her. And I thought that was a wonderful image. Now, we don't have to join a monastery. We don't have to join a nunnery. Uh, I don't have to stop doing the things I do in the world. I have what looks like a job. I have what looks like a home. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a sort of introvert, so I'm not exactly a party person, just in case any of you are getting any bright ideas. I'm not, I, I like to be quiet, but I know plenty of people that live very 
vivid, lively lives, jumping around all over the place, going to all sorts of places, doing all sorts of things, but powered by and connected with God, and it's fine. It's not about what I'm doing. It's about the spirit in which I'm doing it. And specifically, um, uh, I know in, in, I think it's in St. Paul, something about the body being a temple. Uh, well, my temple has been desecrated for years in all sorts of, of lurid ways, so we won't go there. But the point, the point is my mind. My mind is the, you see, I was promiscuous in my mind, and I don't mean sexually. I'd let any old thought in there. Watch any old rubbish on the television, any old rubbish on YouTube, listen to any old person sitting next to me, and it would all go in. And I seem to have no power to stop complete rubbish going into my mind. I'm extremely careful about what I let in, and I'm extremely prompt about what I kick out. This isn't about joining a monastery. It's about creating my own space where it's me and the higher power, and I don't allow any of that other crap in my mind. There's a lot of crap out there. I, I don't want any of that running around. My, it's, it's bad enough it's running around other people's minds. It does not need to run around mine. I'm supposed to ask God what to think, not just to think on my own in a vacuum. I'm supposed to say, God, what do you, how should I look at this? And it's amazing. I'm presented with a tricky situation. God, how should I look at this? The other day, my, my mother is 2,000 years old or, or so. She's over 90 anyway. And she lives in an old people's home. And we got yet when you, when you have a mother or an elderly relative that lives in an old people's home, you're going to get calls which start with uh, things like... Um, uh, I'm really sorry to say that. And then, you know, in this case, it was my mother had been taken very unwell, an ambulance had been called. And I thought, right, I'm not going to put up with any bullshit from my ego about this. I'm not, I, I want to catch this before fear arises. I'm going to catch this before any narratives start. I don't want any of that, any of that crap. Spent too many years thinking rubbish thoughts and then complaining, I'm full of rubbish feelings. Well, that's because I filled my head with rubbish thoughts. So the first thing I did was, right, God, how do I look at this? Show me how to look at this. And pretty clear, go and do what needs to be done. Take a charger with you in your bag so your phone doesn't run out of juice if you're in the hospital overnight. So I got a couple of things uh, in my bag, got ready, went over. We spent the day in hospital. She seems to be on the mend now. So um, uh, we'll see what's happening with that. But I don't need to turn a drama into a crisis if I go to God first, rather than running around like a crazed maniac and then only going to God three days later or 15 years later, you know, having caused all sorts of <laughs> carnage. Go to God for the only thing I, I'm better. I'm not being sober a long time. It doesn't mean you're better. It just means you've been at it longer and there's a chance you'll do the right thing sooner rather than later. There's a chance you'll do the right thing sooner or later, but just, just out of sheer uh, uh, pain, the memory of the, you see the difference today with a relationship with a higher power, the memory of the pain is now vivid enough to make me to go to God straight away rather than waiting. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200 pounds. Go straight to God. Turn off Ego 101 FM. Stop it. <laughs> and I say there's a Bob Newhart sketch. Stop it. If you go to, if you go to YouTube and put, pop in Bob Newhart, stop it. It's an amazing sketch. I won't spoil it if you're not familiar with it. Someone, someone explain to the kids who Bob Newhart is. So if you hang around later, then ask one of the grown-ups and they'll tell you. But it's I don't need to analyze the ego thoughts. I just need to recognize, oh, it's my ego speaking, therefore it's rubbish. Go straight to God. A couple more quotations and I'm done. Page 100. When we look back, we realize 
that the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. Follow the dictates of a higher power and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world, no matter what your present circumstances. What this means is, it's so wonderful, I don't need to plan. A planning mind is a mind that doesn't trust God. Now, it doesn't mean, so I don't take the occasional precaution. I take some precautions in my life. I don't plan the overall course of my life. I don't work out where I'm going to be in five years' time. I don't care. I'll be with God, wherever that is. Um, I, I had a situation a few years ago uh, where... And this is for the Alanons. I booked a holiday with an alcoholic. <laughs> and the alcoholic had a lick of the sherbet. Um, and he started drinking again. I was saying to my sponsor, oh, I don't know whether to cancel or I don't know whether to go or go on my own or not go. I don't know what to do. He said, it doesn't matter because you'll have God with you either way. So it doesn't matter. And that's the answer with a lot of things. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm happier in my life than I have any business being, given my history and given my family. Uh, I couldn't have orchestrated any of this. Um, and the part where I've ended up in my um, in my life. I don't think you could plan it if you tried. I mean, just one, just one tiny thing that I did. A, I remember thinking a few months ago, I was, I'm a translator and I was translating a Macedonian pharmaceutical document. And I had one of those moments when you think, this is very strange, because this is what I'm doing for a living. I don't have a medical degree. I don't have a pharmaceutical degree. I've never attended a class on Macedonian, yet here I am translating a pharmaceutical document from Macedonian into English, and the client was thrilled. Um, I wouldn't have known to plan that. And if I tried to plan it, I would have, I would have tried a different path. I would, the path that I've been on ha, equip, has equipped me to be able to do that. But nothing in that path looked as though it was going to head in that direction. Everything, everything in my life is like that. So I don't care. I, just, I, don't, I don't have a care in the world. When I do, I'm being silly. That's all. And my other half treats me like a child when I'm being silly about things. He says, you're brave and strong, and he won't have any, any of it. He won't indulge it for one moment because I've got higher power on my side. Spiritual Paul used to say, um, <laughs> he said, people, they worry about, they don't know what's around the corner. I don't know what's around the corner. Me higher power's around the corner, so I'm going to be all right. You want to be blessed, not stressed. You've got a higher power 24 hours a day. What's the problem? Talk to them. Don't listen to the ego. My ego is not my amigo. Talk to God. <laughs> there we go. Tell him what's going on. And don't try and wangle inside info out of God. That will not work. You'll get a slap. You'll get put on the naughty step if you do that. A friend of mine took magic mushrooms to lift, lift the curtain and have a special relationship with God. Well, where, where, <laughs> uh, time will tell where that one goes. I don't know. I don't know. It's not for me, any of that crap. Because you see, the thing is, my job is to work out what to do today. And how do I know what to do? I do the things other people ask me to do. They say, can you do this? Can you do that? So I do that. I don't need magic mushrooms to know to say yes when people make a request. I don't think magic mushrooms would help with that or ayahuasca or anything else. A relationship with God is simple and practical and straightforward.
when my other half comes home from work and he's in a bad mood, I don't need special meditation techniques to figure I better keep out of his way, make the dinner, keep my mouth shut, make it clear I'm available, but don't intrude. It's common sense. It's common sense. Uh, last quotation, uh, page 130. Those of us who have spent much time in the world of spiritual make-believe have eventually seen the childishness of it. This dream world has been replaced by a great sense of purpose, accompanied by a growing consciousness of the power of God in our lives. We have come to believe he would like us to do two things. Number one, keep our heads in the clouds with him. Number two, but that our feet ought to be firmly planted on earth. You see, I had my head in head in the gutter and my legs in the air. Wrong way round. You want your head up in the clouds with God, feet on the ground. And it says that is where our fellow travellers are and that is where our work must be, must be done. So I think my job is to have good relationships with other people where I'm helpful and tolerant. And when I do that, I seem to have a relationship with God. No relationships with other people, no God, no work, no 